But let's move on. On the fifth day, we have the sea animals uh, and, and birds uh, uh, created. And boy, if you, yeah, again, this is so frustrating to go through this because each one of these subjects is elegantly uh, 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 illuminates the skill of the designer. Uh, you can take something as trivial as a bird's feather and you could spend a whole evening on discovering how skillfully that's designed. And to attribute that to happenstance or accident is nonsense. But we won't get into all that here. The real death of Darwinism comes uh, from lots of reasons, but not the least of which is microbiology. Advances in microbiology, namely the DNA and all that, have dealt the death blow. They put the final nails in Darwin's coffin in a sense. Because the DNA that we now discover is a three out of four error correcting code. And we have time to develop that, but it's, it, it's just utterly absurd to attribute the elegance of that code to random chance. And when you design a computer, you've got to have the language and the machinery processing that language intimately coordinated. To ascribe either one or certainly together as randomness is, uh, follow, is, the, is absolute folly in, in logic. And uh, Darwinism cannot explain the origin of life because it cannot explain the origin of information. And uh, it, there's another concept that's emerging called irreducible complexity. We're indebted to Michael Behe's book, Darwin's Black Box, where he illustrates this idea with a simple mousetrap. Here we have a mousetrap that has uh, five parts. It has a basic platform on which there's a hammer. That hammer is driven by a spring. It's held back by a holding bar that's tucked under a catch. All of us are familiar with a mousetrap. And uh, what's interesting, there are five parts here. Trying to make this simpler is pretty futile. It's, it's, uh, these five parts have to be there in some function or another. It's interesting that if you have only four of the five parts, you don't catch four-fifths as many mice, you catch zero. The point is there's a concept in design called irreducible complexity. It can't get simpler than this. And that indicates it's designed. It can't happen by accident. And let's take a, a single-celled creature called a bacteria, uh, a bacteria. It has a flagellum, a little tail that propels it through its fluid. And if you look at this carefully, all we're, gonna, we're not going to get into all the other details. This is a single-celled animal. And we're going to just look at where the flagellum is connected to the creature. And we discover there are 40 parts to an electric motor. It doesn't wiggle, it spins. And it, it is an elegantly designed motor with 40 critical parts, any one of which missing it doesn't work. So this did not happen by chance. It evidences uh, designs, highly skillful design. And so uh, uh, we won't get uh, here into all that detail. But then we get, of course, to the next day. We have animals, and on the sixth day we have animals, mammals, and, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Man uh, created in day six. And uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, most of us are victims of this nonsense promoted by our textbooks and even in National Geographic and Scientific American publish these crazy things, the soul I, that we came from monkeys and that nonsense. When you get into this and study it with any uh, depth at all, you'll discover something astonishing. Not only is this nonsense, it's deliberate fraud. The Heidelberg man was contrived from a single jawbone. The Nebraska man in 1922, Henry Osborne, did it from just one tooth. And they later discovered it was from an extinct pig. The Piltown man you hear so much about. Charles Dawson developed this from the jawbone of a modern ape. It was deliberate fraud. We now know it was filed and treated with iron salts to look old. Now, if you get to the Peking man in 1921, the evidence has disappeared, but it also bears evidence of an outright fraud. These are not people who made a discovery and were just misguided. These are people who deliberately contrived these things to be misleading. The Neanderthal man, found in the cave in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. At the International Congress of Zoology in 1958, they concluded that it was just simply an old man suffering from arthritis. The Java man, 1922, uh, in 1891, uh, skull cap, uh, a 50-foot femur thigh bone that was not, was not even near it. It was distant from it. And they, the evidence was concealed. It was teeth of a, uh, an orangutan. The thing that disturbs you about paleontology is that it's littered with deliberate frauds, not just poor science, but deliberate frauds. So all this is still, you'll still find in the textbooks used in your schools to mislead our kids. In 120 years of searching, there have been no intermediate stages found to justify evolution. We could go on and on, but let's move on here. We get to day seven, the seventh rest. The seventh day rest. And you'll notice there's no Erev and Boker. There's no discrete steps. God had finished his creation. It's completed. That's the whole theme of day seven. 
and there's no error on the, uh, uh, Booker. For instance, now our problem in this so-called day, hold as universe in the day, is it's clear that God intended us to understand that. And our problem is not Genesis 1. People talk about the word yom and what it might mean. That's silliness. It's Exodus 20, verse 11, where the creator of the universe with his own finger wrote it in stone. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. And incidentally, he didn't do that in Exodus 20. He did that in Genesis uh, 1. And so... uh, so our problem isn't in, in grasping the six-day thing. It's clear God intended us to understand that he did it in six days. And in uh, days as we think of them. I won't quibble about 24-hour business, but clearly it's, it's a day-by-day thing. And the real mystery to those that really understand who God is, is why did he take six days? But in any case, that's what he chose to do, and he did. The, the field of thermodynamics has been really solidified in 125 years. It's been fully described. And the first law of of thermodynamics is called the conservation of matter and energy. It asserts that matter and energy, they can equivalent, they're equivalent to each other, uh, can neither be created nor destroyed under natural circumstances. And nowhere in the universe is matter being created or annihilated. All observed processes in the universe conserve matter or its equivalent energy. And uh, the corollary to this is natural processes cannot create energy. All of this is a result of a creation of the past. That's the implication of the first law. And you can also say there's no way to win. In other words, the matter and energy uh, is, is, is uh, you can't create either one of them. And uh, it's interesting, that's exactly what the scripture says in Genesis 2. We just, in the seventh day, God ended his work. And uh, that's a thermodynamic statement. The works were finished from the foundation of the world in the book of Hebrews and so forth. All things that were therein, you preserve them all. Nehemiah 9, 6, and it's all through the scripture. Well, there's a second law of thermodynamics, and that's what we call the entropy laws, the second law, the bondage of decay. First law says there's no way to win. The second one says you can't even break even. What it really means is there's an arrow of time. It asserts that as time advances, the universe progresses from a state of order to a state of disorder. And we find that in our closets at home. Clean up the garage and see how long it lasts. Uh, uh, Locker at school, what have you. There's always a trend trend towards randomness, and that's true of all uh, uh, processes. And uh, the uh, universe seems to run downhill to eventually a heat death uh, when no temperature differences exist and therefore no energy is available for for work. And uh, this means, looking back, that the universe had a beginning because uh, the total has been limited. And uh, there's a third law that no one talks about much except in uh, thermodynamics, and that's where every substance has a positive um, entropy, which may become zero at absolute zero, which means you can't get out of the game, but uh, we won't get into that here. Uh, entropy in scripture they shall perish thou shalt grow old as a garment in Psalm 102 the earth will grow old like a garment in Isaiah 51 heaven and earth will pass away Matthew 24 and uh, now is entropy going to be repealed this is one reason a number of us believe that the entropy laws were introduced in Genesis 3 because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of decay and we believe that's an allusion to the entropy laws and obtain the glorious liberty of the, of the children of God. So, heat always flows from hot bodies to cold bodies. If the universe was infinitely old, then the temperature throughout the universe would be uniform. It's obviously not, so therefore it's not infinitely old. That's a simple demonstration that the universe had a beginning and is destined, by the way, for an ending. Scientists will talk about the Big Bang as a, as a singularity that started all this, and it will ultimately reach the end of a uniform temperature, which they call the heat death. But there's finite boundaries when it began, and there's an end at which it will end. Now, as as you can probably gather, this is kind of a frustrating exercise to go through uh, these these, uh, six days, because we spend uh, a full session on each one in our commentary on Genesis. We have a commentary on Genesis, which has 24 sessions for the entire book, uh, just the book. And then Monday we go through the big main models, the fabric of space, hyperdimensions, and all of that. And uh, Tuesday we have life and vegetation. We talk about the origin of life, thermodynamics, and entropy, and molecular chemistry. And the fourth day we have the, the uh, stars and the planets. We refute the so-called nebular hypothesis. We talk about the anthropic principle and uh, the signs in the heavens and such. And the fifth day of the fish and fowl, we talk about the fallacy of evolution. It's obviously shredded very easily. And the evidences of the design everywhere and biodiversity and its role. And the sixth day, we have, of course, the fallacies and frauds I've alluded to, but also the DNA and the role of information in life. 
and thus out of that the architecture of man. Not his physical architecture, his software architecture. And the seventh day, of course, anyone that thinks the seventh day issue is a simple one hasn't studied it. And there are clearly six steps of entropy reduction to get to the seventh day. Then a repose is established on the universe. We'll talk about the Sabbath in prophecy, and that may surprise many Christians are confused on this point. That doesn't put us under the law, but there are some issues that might be quite uh, provocative. And the role of marriage in all of this. But let's uh, wrap this up with Genesis chapter 3, which is, is the seed plot of the entire Bible, where the Nachash, the shining one, uh, presents to Eve the forbidden fruit, and she yields, and that we need to study that carefully to understand the methodology of deception. His first step was to suggest to Eve, yea, hath God said, to create doubt. So that's really what God said. That's exactly what he'll do with each one of us. The first step in deception is to create doubt about what God really said. God means what he said and says what he means. And then from that, of course, the next step is denial. Ye shall not surely die, he suggests, and on they go. So, and that uh, from, from the fall of man, we have the, God's declaration of war. God takes the initiative of the war against Satan, and he alludes to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. There's two seeds. The seed of the, uh, the woman becomes a, ti- a messianic title of the deliverer, of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. But there's also a seed of a serpent that will make his day. And the key verses here in chapter 3 are verses 14 and 15. The Lord God said unto the serpent, or the Nachash, the shining one, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above all every beast of the field. And upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And there are the two seeds. The seed of the woman being the title of Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent being this leader that is yet to surface on the, in world history. And shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, the entropy, the bondage of decay, we believe is introduced here. So we've, we've seen the, the, the order improve through the creation week and sta- stabilize during the seventh day. But then we have this pivotal event called the fall of man in which God puts a curse on the creation. We need to understand that everything we know about the universe, we know from a post-curse universe. We know it only since the curse has been instituted. We have only glimpses or conjectures of what happened prior to the fall. You can't prove to me that Adam and Eve lived only in three dimensions. Uh, This is all a byproduct of the curse. And so the effects of the fall, the entropy, I think, was introduced. The universe fractured. Maybe this is where we separate from the ten dimensions to the four that we can directly experience, separating the physical and spiritual universe. If we imagine, if if I can make a two-dimensional representation of a ten-dimensional universe, and God announces a curse and separates the six from the four, um, the four dimensions that we can experience being what we call the physical universe, that fracture it may be a result of the curse. And there will be a time that, uh, see, the four-dimensional universe that we experience is a subset of a much larger reality, and we know that from, from, uh, our, uh, from empirical data. And so we have... The fracture and redemption, by the way, God's plan of redemption involves more than man alone. Because Isaiah, twice in Revelation, says, I I create a new heavens and a new earth. So there's more than just man involved in all this. The first act of religion is in Genesis 3, verse 7. The eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked. That may mean far more than we have any idea. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons or covering armor or something. Shagor means girdle or loin covering or belt or armor. And uh, so that was their attempt to cover themselves from their fall. But before the chapter ends, God teaches them more correctly. Adam also to his wife, to the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Why did he do that? Because he was teaching them that only by the shedding of innocent blood would they be covered. And while that has a practical aspect that we grab immediately, there's a Levitical aspect there that that uh, there will be the the shedding of innocent blood will be required to free them from the predicament that they're in. So the central theme, the Old Testament is the account of a nation. The New Testament is the account of a man produced by that nation. The Creator became a man and, and, and dwelt among us. And His appearance is the central event of all history. He died to purchase us, and he's alive today. And the most exalted privilege we can get is to know him. And that's what the Bible really is all about. So the scarlet thread begins. From the seed of the woman, the call to, we'll go to the call of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the dynasty of David, finally the virgin birth in Bethlehem, and we'll go to another tree in another garden when Jesus Christ is 
uh, paid uh, for uh, pays for the uh, uh, predicament that we've got ourselves in.